from the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. This is Rendezvous with History, a podcast that captures the drama of presidential decision-making. Dr. Anthony Eames sits down with prominent scholars and leading citizens to bring to life what happens in the White House and how it shapes the world. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. Welcome back, Rendezvous with History listeners. As always, I'm your host, Anthony Eames, here with Dr. Alan Lickman, distinguished professor of U.S. history at American University, and perhaps the most accurate predictor of presidential elections over the last 50 years. Alan, great to have you on the show. Thank you. I guess I just outlived everybody else. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, so Alan, you've... uh, Let's get right out with it. You've called the race for Kamala Harris. You've been on on the media quite a bit uh, these last few months with, I think, anxious Democrats hoping that you're right and anxious Republicans hoping that you're wrong. Um, But before we get into why you called the race for for Kamala Harris, and we will get into that, first I want to talk a little bit about what you see as the, the public obligation uh, of a historian, you you ran for U.S. Senate. Uh, you you, as noted, are a frequent, high-profile political commentator. You know, how does your historical mind shape your public engagement? Yeah, <clears throat> let me say first of all, I don't think there's an obligation for scholars to be out in the in in the public domain. I think it's perfectly legitimate for scholars to stick to their endeavor of uncovering understanding, explaining the past, and not necessarily having public exposure. But that's not me. I, you know, have always been guided by the old saying, I think it's attributed to Horace Mann, be ashamed to die until you've won at least some small battles for humanity. I believe that as an historian, I have a a certain degree of knowledge, a certain skill set, an understanding of how to deal with evidence and find truth. And I have felt a a deep obligation to use my expertise and knowledge for the public good. In fact, I think my most important contribution is not one you mentioned, but I've been an expert witness in some 110 civil rights cases in mostly federal, but also state court all over the nation, including some of the important uh, statewide landmark cases. And really, I think I have very much of a a unique skill set for that. I'm a quantitative historian, so I can do the political analysis required to be an expert witness in civil rights and voting rights and redistricting cases. On the other hand, I'm a teacher. I'm a former college debate or college debate coach. So I know how to put it down where the goats can get it. I am a firm believer that if you can't explain your ideas in a way that ordinary people can understand it, it's their problem, not, excuse me, it's your problem, not their problem. And so in so many ways, you know, the biggest mistake I made was running for office. I should stick to reading, teaching and speaking. And, you know, I've spoken on innumerable uh, political issues, not just in the United States, but, you know, in dozens of countries across the world. Many of my books address critical uh, public policy issues, the rise of the American conservative movement, FDR and the Jews with my colleague Richard Brightman, repeal the Second Amendment, the case for a safer America, 13 cracks, repairing American democracy after Trump, the embattled vote in America from the founding to the present. You know, they're all very factual, very historical, but I have tried to address some of the more pressing issues of our time, as I've done in my uh, television, radio, and written commentary. But I'm curious. Not everyone has to do that. So I'm curious. You know, you, you mentioned something that's going to pique listeners' interest, certainly piqued my interest. You know, as, as we started talking, I'm starting to think of you almost as an activist historian. And then you say, one of the biggest mistakes I made was running for Senate. Why is that the case? Well, it turned out I was a terrible candidate. <laughs> as you can see, I love talking about issues, but I didn't like promoting myself, you know, as a politician. Two, I vastly miss 
uh, misunderstood the electorate. I thought they were ready for someone different, someone who wasn't just stamped in the same old, same old mode, but someone who, you know, has made public contributions, but in a different way as an educator, a scholar, uh, an expert witness, a commentator. No. And third, I misunderstood Maryland politics. You know, my model was Paul Wellstone. I think he was the last lifetime college professor to get elected to the Senate in Minnesota. Well, Maryland is no Minnesota. It's a very closed politics. So, you know, that was my big mistake. But I don't regard anything else that I've talked about as a mistake. <laughs> All right. Well, you may have misunderstood the Maryland electorate, but it seems like you, you have a good understanding of the American electorate and presidential elections. And, and that starts uh, with the election of, of, of re-election of our namesake, Ronald Reagan in 1984. But you make the call in April 1982 at a time where things weren't looking so good for a Reagan re-election two years down the road. Uh, walk me back into that time 40 plus years ago. I mean, what's going through your head as you make the decision to work with your colleague to form those 13 keys that I, I hope you tell us each one. And, um, you know, what, what's pushing you in that direction? What are the, the intellectual currents that are kind of forging those ideas about presidential elections for you? Well, this was, of course, my first prediction right after uh, my colleague and I developed the keys in 81. And I'd love to tell you I developed the keys by rooting my eyes in the archives. And by the way, I've been to the Reagan Library. It's a great place. I've done a lot of research there. But that's not to, you know, if I were to say that, to quote the late, not so great Richard Nixon, that would be wrong. Like a lot of discoveries, there's a lot of serendipity involved in this. In 81, I was a distinguished visiting scholar at Caltech in Southern California, and there I met the world's leading authority on earthquake prediction, Vladimir Kailas Borak from Moscow, one of the world's great scientists. And it was his idea that we collaborate. And of course, being brilliant and foresightful, I said, no or not. Earthquakes may be a big deal here in Southern California. I have to go back to D.C. where I teach at American University. Nobody cares about earthquakes there. He said, oh, no, I already solved earthquakes. Right. But he said, get this. In 1963, he was a member of the Soviet scientific delegation that came to D.C. and negotiated the most important treaty in the history of the world by far, the nuclear test ban treaty. It's the reason we're still around. And he said... In Washington, I fell in love with politics and always wanted to use the methodology of earthquake prediction to predict elections. I live in the Soviet Union. Elections, forget it. It's supreme leader or off with your head. But he says, you, me, you're an expert in the presidency, American politics and history. So we became the odd couple of American political research. And we looked at every presidential election from 1860 to 1980 using Kailas Borak's methods of pattern recognition to see what patterns in the political environment were associated with, put it in earthquake terms, stability, the White House party keeps power, earthquake, they're turned out. And that procedure led to the 13 keys to the White House, which primarily gauged the strength and performance of the White House party. Doesn't relate much to campaigning. The big message is it's governing, not campaigning that counts, and our six key decision rule. But, Anthony, as you know, we haven't predicted anything yet. The first prediction came in April of 1982. And again, it was by accident. I had sent my Kyla Sporak and I, as you know, when you come up with a big discovery and you're a couple of academics, you publish it in an academic journal where you expect at least four or five people to actually read it. Well, it turned out we published in the Proceedings of the U.S. National Academies of Science, and a sixth person read it, the science reporter for the Associated Press. And I opened the newspaper one day back in my office, and the article says, Odd Couple Discovers keys to the White House. Had to be Lickman and Kylas Borak. So I sent my stuff to the Washingtonian magazine, and I get a call from their most junior editor, Ken DeSell. DeSell says, Lickman, didn't understand a word of that article you wrote with the crazy Russian guy, but are you telling me 
This is 81. You can predict who's going to be the next president. And I could have given him the legitimate academic answer, probability, caveat, margin of error. And I knew my career as a forecaster would be over in 10 seconds. So I said, Mr. DeSell, yes, I can. And that led to the April 1982 prediction of Ronald Reagan's reelection when he was way down in approval, around 43 percent, and 60 percent of Americans said he was too old to run again. But I disregard all that, and I have for the subsequent 42 years. I stick to the keys, and the way it works, if six or more of my keys went against the White House party, I would predict their defeat. Fewer than six, I predict their win. And I only saw three keys going down against the Reagan administration. Well, then I get another call. And this gentleman says, this is Lee Atwater calling, political director of the Ronald Reagan White House. We want you to come to the White House. I'm thinking, well, maybe you got the wrong guy. I'm kind of friendly with George McG No, no, we know who you are. So I go to the White House, spend the whole day there. At the end of the day, Lee Atwater, who was Carl Rove before there was Carl Rove, the original hardball operator, he asked me the real question why he brought me there. He says, Lickman, what would happen on your system if Ronald Reagan didn't run again? 60% of Americans thought he shouldn't. And I said, I'll be straight with you. You're down three keys. He doesn't run again, you lose incumbency. That's four. You lose party contests, because Bush and Kemp and Robertson will fight like crazy. That's five. Remember, six and you're out. Incumbent charisma? Without the Gipper? Forget it. George Bush is about as charismatic as a New Jersey shopping center on Sunday morning. That's six, and you're out. So you go from a sure win to a predicted loss. Atwater looks me in the eye, breathes a huge sigh of relief, says, thank you so much, Professor Lichtman, and the rest is history. And by the way, although we're kind of opposite in our political views, believe it or not, Lee Atwater and I became good buddies. And, you know, he died prematurely young in his 40s and recanted all his dirty tricks. And his biography, Bad Boy, talks about his fascination with the keys. Uh, that might have to be another episode of some, some more stories between you and Lee Atwater. Oh, so yeah. let's get into the keys themselves. And this yeah. is this is interesting because uh, uh, the issue of pattern recognition. I mean, as historians, we make judgment. I'm going to I'm going to do something to you here. I'm going to pull an article on you from the Washington Post in December 1983. I don't goes through, it, so go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and it it uh, it goes through your keys and one of the one of the ones it says is there's been no social unrest. Key is uh, for Reagan. And yet at that time, we know the nuclear freeze movement had been very active, had the largest protest in American history the year before in Central Park. How do you make those judgments about when a he reaches a threshold? Yeah. You know, early on, as you read an 83 article, I was blasted by the professional forecasters for committing the so-called sin of subjectivity with some of my keys, like social unrest. And I said, no, they're not subjective, they're judgmental. And historians make judgments about the past all the time. If you try to abolish judgment, you're going to create a lot of errors. And it's not just subjective judgment. Each key is very carefully defined. And remember, developmentally, I went all the way back to 1860. So it's covered an enormous period of great changes in our politics, our society, our economics, and our demography. Well, it took about 15 to 20 years. So save your bell bottoms. You never know what might come into style again. And the professional forecasting community came to agree with me that their so-called quantitative objective models didn't work. And by the way, they still don't work. Uh, I can tell you a lot of stories about them, but they realized that the best model that worked was like the keys that combined some cut and dried indicators like uh, U.S. House election results, uh, real per capita growth with judgmental but carefully defined indicators. And all of a sudden, the keys to the White House were the hottest thing in forecasting. I twice keynoted the International Forecasting Summit, some incredible thing for an historian. And the 
Premier Journal and Applied Forecasting Foresight published a special issue devoted to the keys, explaining why they were well suited to predicting presidential elections. So you cite, for example, social unrest seems very subjective, but I actually define it very carefully. It's got to be massive, sustained social unrest that calls into question the stability of the country. So in 83, what I was looking at was the Reconstruction period and the late 60s and early 70s. And clearly what was going on in the Reagan administration, while of some significance, did not rise to the level of that kind of social unrest that called into question the stability of the society. Well, you, so you, some social unrest. It's interesting. You, you know, we looked at Reconstruction. We look at the Civil Rights Movement. What you're talking about there um, is the massive expansion of the voting franchise and in that data set 1860 to 1980 elections really do change the, the way in which media operates changes the number of and who can vote changes uh demographics of the of the u.s electorate changes how did you kind of calibrate for those changes over time yeah our theory which is proven correct but could always change is that Regardless of the technology, the state of the economy, look, in 1860, we didn't even have automobiles, didn't have radio, didn't have television. Talk about enormous changes. We're an agricultural society. Women couldn't vote. Most African-Americans were enslaved. But our theory, which has held up, is that regardless of all of these changes, the basic pragmatic judgment of the American electorate as to whether the White House party... Uh, has performed well enough to get another four years, or we need a change, has really held up. You know, I'm a little bit surprised that it's held for over 40 years. You know, every theory has a shelf life, and it's amazed me the extent to which this has had such a successful shelf life. Well, let's talk about its, its, its staying power, because if I have this right, there's only been one instance where it, it, the, the keys were kind of uh, not as finely tuned as you would have liked, perhaps. And if, if I have that right, it's the 2000 election. Is that yes. correct? Yeah, so we what, talked about that. So what, what, what went wrong in 2000? And uh, did it lead to a period of kind of searching for a new answer? Or did, did it reinforce kind of your beliefs? You know, after my successful prediction of Donald Trump in 2016, which you can imagine did not make me popular in 90% plus Democratic DC, where I teach at American University. Uh, so after my successful, almost unique, not quite, but close, I won, I was co-winner of the Steckler Award for Courage in Forecasting. I got a letter of congratulations from guess who? Donald Trump himself. Imagine that. It's hanging on, in my home office. I so, don't think you'll get one this time around. I don't think so. I didn't get one in 2020 either. Any rate, so uh, because of my successful 2016 prediction, I was invited on the Bill Maher show. And he also asked me, about 2000 in much less polite terms, you can imagine, than you did. He said, how did you F up 2000? And I said, I didn't. Florida did. The wrong person was elected president based on the intent of voters. Al Gore should have won Florida going away in the presidency. And I proved it in my report to the United States Commission on Civil Rights in 2001. And I was asked, I, I didn't approach them, which showed that one out of nine to 10 ballots cast by a 95% Democratic African American was thrown out. These weren't voter suppression. This was people who voted who had their ballots invalidated compared to one out of 50 for whites. And Almost nobody knows this, but most of those ballots thrown out for black voters were not the hanging chads and dimples. No, they were so-called overvotes. African-Americans didn't trust the system. After all, the governor was the brother, Jeb Bush, of the Republican candidate, George W. 
pushed. So they punched in Al Gore, and then just to be sure, wrote in Al Gore, and all of those votes were tossed out by Florida. My analysis was proven independently, had nothing to do with it. Another study by Professor Walter Meebane of Cornell University, one of America's leading political scientists, and the title of his article is The Wrong Man is President! Exclamation point. But we could we could relitigate 2000 forever, and I'm sure historians will long before we're long after we're gone. <laughs> All right. So if we can't trust the Florida ballot, let's talk about other things. We can't trust the polls. Yes. And you have a lot to say about why we shouldn't trust or rely on polls. And, and of course, as a fellow historian, I'm always happy to say we should rely on our sense and knowledge of history more than than quantitative polls. But what what is your kind of methodological issue with polls? Before I get to my methodological issue, I have a substantive good government, good society issue. The media is obsessed with polls. You know, I am old enough to remember Kennedy Nixon. In fact, I saw Kennedy in New York when I was 13. And by the way, all the claims about his charisma, they're not overstated. He blew us away, even young kids like me. Those days, we had a poll once every couple of weeks. Nobody cared. Now we have a poll every few hours, and the media jumps on it as though they're, you know, revelations from, from you know, Mount Sinai. Uh, a 1% change in the polls, you know, oh, Trump has leaped ahead, Harris has leaped ahead. Why is this so pernicious? Because it creates the false impression that elections are horse races with candidates leaping ahead and falling behind according to the day-to-day -day events of the campaign with the pollsters keeping score. And that leads the media to neglect what is really important about this election. I have a live show every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern at Alan Lichtman on YouTube, A-L-L-A-N-L-I-C-H-T-M-A-N, YouTube. And I devoted my last show to Donald Trump's deportation plans and did an extensive analysis of the disaster to people's human rights, to the economy. The media has spent 10 times more attention on the polls than things like what is the deportation plan going to mean for the country. So it's terrible, terrible for good government and a good society. Now, methodologically, one, polls are snapshots. They're abused as predictors. They only tell you what's happening at the moment. And there's no way to check because there's no independent verification other than to take a bunch of other polls. Secondly, the error margin is far greater than they tell you. You know, you've heard it's plus and minus 3%. That's pure statistical error. That's the error you would get if you had a big jar of green and red balls and you pulled out a sample to estimate the percentage of green and red balls in the jar. But human beings are not green and red balls. They don't respond to pollsters. They may lie. They're not, they're not voting today, so they may change their mind. Plus, the pollsters don't know who's actually going to vote. That's why you have these likely voters, which are pure guesses. That at least doubles the margin of error, the plus and minus six, which means the gap has to be about 12 points for it to be anything other the noise and that non-statistical error is not random. It's unidirectional. You know, the polls underestimated Republicans in 2016. Well, based on more recent elections from 2022 to 2024, they may be underestimating Democrats. We don't know. But what's going to matter is in which direction are the polls off, not where they stand at the moment. So let's turn to today because, you know, you told us the story about Lee Atwater bringing you to the White House and asking you the question, what would happen if the president dropped out, which really seems like a story you could have told about, you know, six months ago. What yeah. would have happened if Biden had dropped out? Now, you were on record as saying that Biden would ultimately triumph in the 2024. No, 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 no. no. I said a lot would have to go wrong. I did not actually make a prediction that Biden would win. I okay, said, let's make that clear. Then. Wrong, it could. You never know. Right. Okay. So that's good. You were not on record, but a lot would have to go wrong. What happened for your keys, for your for your predictive model yeah. when when Biden dropped and when Kamala Harris jumped in as the as the Democratic candidate? A very important question. 
You're correct to the extent that I was very critical of the Democrats for openly trashing their sitting president, ran out in public. I've never seen that before, and I've studied politics since the founding. I also thought they were headed for a disaster, that not only would they push Biden out, which would not be disastrous unto itself, but they would also have a big party brawl, which would mean they'd lose two of my keys, contest and incumbency. And no White House party has ever been reelected when they lost both of those keys. Maybe they listen to me. I don't know. Possibly. Uh, I have had some consultations on you know, both sides of the aisle. At any rate, they grew a spine and a brain, rare for the Democrats, and they united behind Harris. So that meant they only lost one key, not fatal. In addition, the nomination of Harris might have helped them with two other keys, the third party key. Voters no longer had to choose between two old white guys. I hate saying that being an old white guy myself, but it's true. I think that contributed to the fizzling of RFK Jr. Social unrest. Well, you know, he had some sporadic protests, but Biden was the target. Now Biden's in the background and the protests have dissipated. So the keys fully take into account exactly what happened within the Democratic Party. The big message is something has to change a key to influence my predictions. All these other, you know, ephemeral things that the media latches onto, unless they turn a key one way or the other, have no role in my in my system. Well, let's talk about how things do change. And you've been at American University for several decades now, teaching <laughs> undergraduate and graduate students about the American presidency, about elections in America. And I'm curious, you know, how have students come to see the presidency and the presidential election differently in that time? Well, we got up demarcated into two periods, pre-Trump and post-Trump. Remember, this is American University in the midst of very liberal, democratic Washington, D.C. You know, so you, you got to understand the context <laughs> and up until the advent of Trump, uh, my students, well, let me say generally, you know, this notion, oh, the good old days, you know, when students were so much better and did their home. It's nonsense. My students have gotten way better over time. My students today are far better at every aspect of academia than students were when, believe it or not, I first started in 1973. But of course, you know, being in a liberal institution, Donald Trump has really undermined their faith in the presidency and their faith in American institutions. And my students are very, very worried about their future. They're very worried about whether democracy will survive in the era of Trump. And they're very worried about their future on the planet. You know, at my age of 77, I'm not going to bear the brunt of catastrophic climate change, but my kids are. And it's not a theory anymore. It's here. We saw the hurricanes in Florida, the wildfires in the West, the droughts, the floods, the tornadoes, the sea rise, Miami floods when it's not even raining. And my students are terribly worried, you know, that either we're not taking it seriously enough or half of our politicians are outright denying it. So let's let's jump to our wrap here. It's uh, sure. something we like to do on every episode, a hints for history section. And that's where you tell us, you know, what's the uh, kind of underutilized archive, the underutilized methodology, the underutilized or understudied topic uh, no. for, for kind of, let's call them early career historians. What, what should they be paying attention to that might pay big dividends for them down the road uh, like the keys did for you? Well, I hate to say what's going to pay big dividends for them except excellence. You know, academia as its best, at its best, ignores politics. I have sat in on God knows countless, you know, interviews for hiring and promotion. Never once did I know what the politics of anyone was who I was interviewing or even try to find it out. So if you really want to succeed, and this is the reason I've been successful as a forecaster. I've kept my politics out of it. You have to distinguish very sharply 
between your own views, which are fine. You can have whatever views you want and the search for the truth. Search for the truth has to be impartial. It cannot be tainted. And this is so important today because truth is under such siege in our society today. And that's promoted by the social media. They're not interested in giving people, you know, alternative information so they can decide for themselves. No, that's not how they make money. They want to reinforce what you already think and then insulate you from any alternative ideas or evidence. And, you know, it's really important as academics uh, that we crack through that. I think we as academics and very much as historians need to help our society restore the search for the truth in an impartial way. However, the truth may fall. You know, I talked about being at a liberal institutions, yet I've predicted the two most conservative presidents of our time, Reagan and Trump, because I've devoted myself to the search for the truth. The other thing that's really important, and this isn't so much for historians, but I've encountered this particularly for political science, and that is we should not presume that as scholars dealing with human beings and human history, we should slavishly model ourselves on the hard sciences. We're not hard science, and we have to take into account human frailties, judgment, and those kinds of considerations. We can't just reduce it down to so-called objective numbers. That doesn't work. And I say that as a quantitative historian. You know, I was one of those pioneers way back in the 70s who pioneered the so-called new history, the use of social science and quantitative methods to better understand the past. And what I've learned is just like the keys, the best kind of research combines qualitative analysis along with strict mathematical analysis. You've got to put the two together. You, you can't pull them apart. And unfortunately, so much of the intellectual life in our society doesn't merge them and looks at them as they are two entirely separate ways of uh, finding truth. No, they're complementary ways of finding truth. And it's important that we pay attention to both kinds of methods. But the most important advice I have is fidelity to truth. That's so fragile. And academics, above all, need to focus on that fundamental idea. Because once truth goes, everything else falls apart. Well, Alan, I think that's as good a message as any to wrap up here today. Thanks again for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. And we'll see in a couple of weeks if your record stands and uh, <laughs> and uh, that, that near-perfect mark uh, continues on. You know, I'm a human being. Of course, I can be wrong. Changes can be so catastrophic as to break the pattern of 100 years, 60 years of history. I don't expect it. But the truth is, like a scientific revolution, you can't know until it's already happened. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, thank you, Alan. Rendezvous with History is a podcast produced by the Ronald Reagan Institute Scholarly Initiatives. You can learn more at RonaldReaganInstitute.org and follow along on social media at Reagan Institute.